Good morning, church family. Today is the 25th of August, 2024. Mom, my mother's birthday is tomorrow. And she's going to be, what, 45? Happy birthday. Uh, welcome to the Mule Shoe Methodist Church. Of course, I'm Jay Cage, and I'm the liturgist for the month of August. Been a steamy, hot couple of weeks. I know everybody would agree with that, but at least your phone and my phone agree that it's going to... Uh, cool off hopefully so relief is on the way a special shout out and welcome to all visitors and all listeners on channel 6 as well as Facebook nice to see everybody glad to see everybody here please sign and pass attendant pads down they're located at the end of each pew we appreciate of course a record of everybody who's who's here and don't forget that we leave our ties uh, at the back in the uh, offering plates in the foyer there are also prayer cards located at the back of each pew. So if you're so moved, take a moment to list any prayers in which we can share as a church family. For those that I'm aware of, we're still praying for Jesse Tarango, Lori Bales and her family on the passing of her sister, Kathy Richards, Dorothy Wire and her family on the passing of David. We still have his roses reminding us of a life well lived. And Cheyenne, where are the Cheyennes? We, she's got a um, bouquet on the Aww. altar there in, in memory of her grandmother, yeah, Carolyn Rogers. Thank you. Um, they represent a beautiful celebration of life. Let's keep all of these brothers and sisters in Christ in our prayers. By way of announcements, uh, the ladies' Bible study tomorrow at 9, the men's at 6 in the afternoon, all in the Life Tree Room. Are there any other announcements that I've failed to mention. With that, I'll turn things over to Haley and the choir as they lead us in song and music. Okay, would you please rise and join with us? So we're going to sing a little song called We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise. <laughs> bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the lord we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the lord and we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy. Thank you. You may be seated now. Well, good morning. Nope. Oh, I get all scratchy here on the microphone. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, well, it's a great morning. You know, of course, as uh, Jay's mentioned, and I'm pretty sure many of you are aware, it's been hot. Um, but uh, fortunately, that's uh, kind of looks like it's maybe finally we might be transitioning into another season soon, uh, if not this week, the following week. Uh, so we're going to be rejoicing in that. Um, I think. Uh, we can uh, be thankful for uh, the different seasons, but we can definitely be thankful when those seasons change uh, to something that's more comfortable. Uh, we get used to the hot weather uh, and get oppressed with the hot weather, and then we get the cold weather, and then we get oppressed with the cold weather, and then we get back to the hot weather. So it's it's a, 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 an interesting situation, that, uh, but we can rejoice in all of it. 
Um, we can be thankful for air conditioning, and uh, we can th be thankful for um, a lot of things. But this morning, uh, I want to uh, uh, just, uh, I see a few faces that we haven't seen in a while, um, and it's great to uh, see some people who weren't here last Sunday and everything like that. It's great to, to see so many of you here this morning. Again, it's a, a, a great day to worship the Lord. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, even if it's 90-something uh, <laughs> We're still going to be glad and rejoice in it. Um, and I do want to uh, thank Jay for his good service in, in this month as liturgist. Uh, since you've done such a great job, you don't have to do it next Sunday, Jay. So we'll, we'll have somebody else. We'll have somebody else doing it. really appreciate uh, everybody who uh, uh, takes the time to do that. Um, really enjoy that. It's really nice to have... Uh, uh, people willing to sing, a great pianist, uh, and backups when we need them. Uh, so it's great uh, that uh, we have talent and people willing to step up and do things in this church. Uh, but with that, all that said, um, <clears throat> you know, we have an interesting sermon this morning, and I hope I don't disappoint by saying that. Uh, so we're going to have some interesting uh, topics to talk about this morning. But with that said, uh, let us uh, first go into our uh, time of prayer uh, this morning. So if you would please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your provision, your gifts. We thank you for your grace and your love. And Lord, although there are those of us in this morning who have sorrow in our hearts or sadness or depression, may the Holy Spirit help us to rejoice and celebrate in you. And Lord, there are many things in this world, many concerns, whether in our individual lives or in our national situation and in all over the world Lord there's so much trouble and concern so many things that should worry us but all those worries we hand over to you for we know that you are our helper you are our restorer you are our Lord you are our King of Kings. And no matter what has happened or what will happen, may we glorify you. And Lord, just as we celebrate and worship and fellowship with you this morning, you know, and here in a moment we'll be giving, uh, celebrating our tithes and offerings, Lord, we just ask that every ounce of our life that we give to you, whether it's financial or prayer or physical time, Lord, may you take what we give to you and you multiply it a hundredfold not for the glory of Muleshoe Methodist Church, but for the glory of your kingdom, for the glory of your house. And Lord, may we not forget whose image we bear, whose breath we breathe, whose sacrifice we rest upon. And Lord, in this morning as we here at Muleshoe Methodist Church come together to celebrate and to worship you and to be with one another in this great privilege of faith and joy, may we not forget our brothers and sisters around the world. May we not forget those around the world who do not know you that we may be the light of Christ to those 
living in the darkness. And together this morning with all our brothers and sisters around the world, we come together to worship you here, but with our brothers and sisters around the world in many different languages today, Lord. And as we say our family prayer, may we not forget that your kingdom is without end. As we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we uh, uh, prepare to move into our time of offering, and Haley's going to be playing uh, uh, some music for that, I would ask that you reflect on something. Uh, you reflect on um, an odd statement that Jesus made in, in Matthew 24, uh, verse 37, uh, which is uh, in concerning his return or the, the end of days, uh, Jesus told his disciples that that period, that time will be like the days of Noah. And ask yourself or reflect on what does that really mean, the days of Noah. And with that, let us move into our offering time. Okay, it's children's time. Would the children please join Cheyenne up in front of the church? I see some bashful ones back there. Y'all are more than welcome to come up if you want to. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're like, don't call me out like that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I don't have Kate here. She's kind of my toddler wrangler. She kind of makes sure Charlie stays in one spot up here while I talk. So I'm missing my girl Kate this morning. But I'll talk to everybody today because Charlie might be in a la-la land this morning, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we're all children of God, so we can all hear the message. Amen. So my message this morning, I really struggle with what to come up with after you do children's time, and I'm sure Pastor Dave struggles with this too, but after you give... A, a message he probably struggles to come up with different messages and I do the same with children's time but it hit me this morning uh, really yesterday I started to think about it but this morning I said yep that's what I'm gonna do so um, I was gonna tell all the kids this morning that football season is about to start or has started in the preseason I guess with scrimmages in the NFL preseason and so that's an exciting time um, and that those players are constantly practicing and practicing to get it perfect for game day. And um, I wanted to let the kids know that 
our relationship with God doesn't have to be like that. Yes, we want to practice to be good Christians and, and do the things that we're supposed to do correctly. We need to practice sitting up here for children's time, obviously. <laughs> um, but our relationship with God, while it does take work, it doesn't have to be perfect. And he's going to love us regardless. And so that's the message that I wanted to give the kids today. But if everybody will bow your heads and pray with me, we'll pray together. Y'all don't have to repeat after me, though. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to make mistakes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to receive your grace and your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Here you go. Is that correct? There you go. <laughs> thank you, Cheyenne. Well, Terry's not here today. She's over at Salado celebrating Miles' birthday. And don't ask me how old he is, just because like a normal man, I can't tell you how old he is. But I know he's in the second, third, or fourth grade somewhere around there. So, but anyway, we're, we're, she's over there celebrating that birthday. Any, any other celebrations? All right. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. All right, we're going to sing a little bit again. So would you please join and, and sing with us? Children of the Heavenly Father. Yeah. Some of these might be a little new to everybody. They, they were to me. So. <coughs> Children of the Heavenly Father, Safely in his bosom gather, nestling bird nor star in heaven, such a refuge there was given. God is own doth tend and nourish, in his holy court they flourish, from all evil things he spares. In his mighty arms he bears them. Neither life nor death shall ever from the Lord his children sever. Unto them his grace he showeth, and their sorrows all he knoweth. He giveth, for he taketh, God his children never is taken. In his loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. Oh God, her walls before this stand, dear as the apple of thine eye, and graven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall, for her my prayers are sent.
Thank you. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning uh, comes from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. It's a, it'll be okay. Don't worry. Charlie's crying there. So. I think she must have studied with me this week. Um, so, <clears throat> but Anyways, um, our scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 12. Uh, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was, right, was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now if you would please uh, join me in just a brief time of prayer. Dear Lord, help us to hear and help us to see and to learn what you would have us learn this morning. Help us to know. Come Holy Spirit and open our hearts and our minds and our ears. Come, Holy Spirit, and subdue my thoughts and my words and my will to that of the Father. To the glory of the Father, in the name of the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Well, this morning, um, you know, kind of a little heavy uh, text here, um, interesting text. A lot going on here. Uh, before I get too deep into this, though, I want to uh, uh, put out a uh, term that I think is very important for us to understand, uh, especially whenever we're dealing with the Old Testament. We have a tendency to uh, think things differently than we probably should. And that term that I want you to be aware of is uh, chronological snobbery. Big, big thing. Uh, I've heard quite a number of uh, things about it as far as, you know, who they attribute it to. Uh, there's some theologians that they attribute it to, and then, but kind of the main one that I seem to, to hear often is C.S. Lewis. So that's what we're going to go with. I'm not 100% sure he originated it either, but as far as I could tell, that's as close as we can get to an originator to this term. But the term chronological snobbery is basically thinking that we today are better than generations past. 
that this age is great. And we're so smart. We're so much smarter than they were, you know, even just a hundred years ago. But of course, what we're talking about today is, you know, thousands of years ago, four or six thousand years ago. And I kind of don't look at that, this, you know, really as, as truth because, I mean, not, they're not stupid in the ancient Near East. They may be ignorant of some things that we know about, but we live in an age <clears throat> where, uh, how to put it, you know, I don't think we would have an easy time building a, a, a great pyramid. The ancient uh, people of the ancient Near East, they had a very good understanding of mathematics and a very complicated understanding of mathematics without computers. They built, uh, there, there's a thing called megalithic structures. Uh, they built these structures with astronomical, perfected, perfected astronomical alignment. They, they aligned these buildings, these stone structures, all kinds of stuff to monitor the sun and the moon with such precision and such accuracy. Again, without computers. So I would say, you know, although, you know, we're pretty smart today, I don't think we're as smart as we think we are. Because, you know, we have this thing in our pockets, in our purses, called the smartphone, and we check it off, and, and there's even a calculator on here, so uh, I'm pretty sure if I was uh, <clears throat> around 6,000 years ago, I probably wouldn't be uh, a builder, um, <laughs> just because I, I don't think I would be able to be that precise and stuff. But it's interesting that we have this concept of the ancient Near East being so much primitive and so much less than us. And yet, you know, <clears throat> we can go to uh, a lot of archaeological sites over, all over the world, really, that date back to six, seven thousand 10,000 years ago, I mean, not too, uh, not too recently, well, it is kind of recent, you know, <clears throat> a, a while ago, several decades ago, a place was found called, <clears throat> in uh, Turkey, called Gobekli Tepe, which is Turkish for Potbelly Hill, so it's interesting, it's kind of in the redneck ver uh, uh, part of Turkey, uh, I don't know of any other places uh, in this country that would call a, a hill Potbelly, unless it was in, you know, the deep south somewhere, but <clears throat> anyways, I digress. Well, this this place has a uh, uh, a temple of sorts that dates back, you know, 12,000, 12,500 years ago. And it's interesting because the earliest civilization was in Mesopotamia about 8,000 years ago. You know, so very interesting. Of course, you know, there's a lot of dispute over the dating and stuff, but, you know, I don't know, if, you know it's interesting when, when academics, archaeologists, scientists, when something new comes along or some information comes along and challenges the narrative, uh, we tend to go, uh, no, <laughs> you're just crazy. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because, well, we're going pretty far back. Here in Genesis, we're talking about something very interesting is going on. Now, I understand Genesis <clears throat> maybe differently than some people, but definitely, you know, I'm not the only one who looks at this and, and sees this. But in Genesis, Genesis talks about three rebellions, three transgressions if you will. The first being what we talked about last week, which is the Garden of Eden, the eating of uh, the fruit from the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil, and uh, man and woman getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and they get their names after that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we know this happens. And here's an interesting thing is I cannot remember for the life of me and all, you know, I'm not a young guy. I'm not an old guy, but I'm not a young guy. I've heard a lot of sermons in my life, but I, could never, I cannot recall ever hearing a sermon on Genesis 6, 1 to 12. And this is actually the second transgression or rebellion in Genesis. In Genesis. And there's a lot of interesting things, and there's a lot of reflection in uh, the rest of the Old Testament 
But one of the things about this is, just like I told you, you know, earlier, you know, uh, Jesus, when the, the disciples asked him, how do we know when you're going to be coming back? How do we know when it's the end times and all this stuff? Uh, Jesus says, well, you know, uh, no one knows the exact day and time except for Jesus, not even the Son. Uh, excuse me, only the Father knows, not even the Son knows what day or what hour all this is going to transpire. But <clears throat> the hint is it'll be like the days of Noah. And of course, probably like many of you, when, you, uh, when I hear that, I think about, you know, uh, kind of towards the end of what I read this morning, everybody was uh, wicked. You know, the human heart was wicked. But that's not how this chapter starts out. This chapter starts out with something very interesting, and it's when human be, uh, beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Wait a minute. <laughs> Pause. Let's rewind there. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man, or humans as it's translated in this, as it's put in this one, were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Well, what's this talking about? Who are the sons of God? Now, there is the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ, but who are the sons of God, plural? Well, it isn't talking about us. Because there's no need to say humans married humans. So here is the second transgression in Genesis, which is angels coming down to earth and breeding with humans. Not God's plan. Not God's intention. And it's interesting because what does this produce but the Nephilim? And who are the Nephilim? Well, according to Scripture, and the Nephilim are only mentioned a couple of times in Scripture, but these are giants. Now here's the interesting thing. A lot of times we think scripture is pretty boring. But hello, <laughs> angels and giants. And this ends, this little section ends with, you know, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old and men of renown. And this is interesting because this is reflecting into other cultures in the ancient Near East. The, the, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, all of them had these stories that we still have today, these stories of larger-than-life individuals, these heroes. Of course, they weren't uh, always nice and great and gracious about things. But it's interesting and then immediately following this, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now, <clears throat> if you go back and you look at the last couple of chapters of Genesis, the chapters before six, the chapters four and five, we see you know what happens after the garden. Adam and Eve have two sons. Cain and Abel, I've talked about this before, you know, Cain kills Abel because Cain, well, Cain murders we, the first, the, the first mur murder in history, or at least the first murder in scripture, um, <clears throat> is Cain being jealous of his brother Abel. Well, Cain is uh, set out, uh, forced out uh, to go wander the earth. Uh, he strangely goes out and wanders around. Of course, God marks him to keep him safe. You know, saying, hey, if anybody hurts you, they're going to be uh, punished uh, more than you are being punished for killing your brother. So, But <clears throat> Cain goes and wanders the earth, but eventually he establishes a city 
he gets married and he establishes a city, but of course, you know, Scripture doesn't tell us who he marries or where this person, where this woman came from. <clears throat> but Adam and Eve have a second, uh, have a third son. It's called Seth. And then we get all this genealogy over all these chapters, the last couple of chapters, it just really talks about such and such married this person, had this many kids, and this, this kid did this, and this kid did that, and this person lived for 800 years, this person lived for 600 years, and boy, you got some, you got some very interesting individuals having children 700 years old, 800 years old, so it's an interesting thing to discuss, but the reality is whatever, but we get to this point to where God says, enough's enough, you're only going to, the maximum years that you get on earth is 120 years. All this happens, and yet we get to this, and we get to verse 5, and the Lord saw how wicked everything was. We have these giants, and the Nephilim are giants in the sense of they were big people, not just larger than life, they were big people. And that seems to be the indication of the word Nephilim. Uh, but yet, you know, crazy as it is. But what's going on here? Something happens. Something, a transgression, a rebellion happens here. It's indicated. It's not really talked about, but it's indicated here in verses 1 to 4. Because in verse 5, we immediately go into the wickedness of the world. You know, you don't always have to have wars to have heroes and, and men of renown. But these angels come down in these sons of God, these Bini Elohim, come to earth and they establish something. And something is awry. It isn't just the wickedness of man's heart that God's talking about. That is the problem that God has to deal with because if it's just the wickedness you want to sit here and tell me that man was more wicked then than they are now I got news for you this world has got a lot of wickedness in it and we could sit here and talk about that all day long I can talk about slavery I can talk about abuse So it isn't just that the flood comes because everybody's wicked. The flood comes because there's a lot going on and there is open rebellion, full on open rebellion against God, the Father. And we stop this by washing the earth. Of course, you know, <clears throat> a lot of people are like, oh, well, that never happened. And uh, I'm not saying that I'm somebody who believes in a complete worldwide flood, but I'll tell you that there is a very interesting thing that happened 13,000 years ago. In the age uh, that's often referred to as the Younger Dryas, something happened and scientists and Geologists and archaeologists are just now starting to open up to the possibilities. But there are several individuals out there who have postulated that there was some kind of massive cataclysm that helped end the last, our last ice age. And not over thousands of years, but over a hundred years. And if you stop an ice age rapidly, the, the, the problem is in the title, Ice Age. If you melt ice, what happens? It floods. There's water. Ice goes from solid to liquid. Something massive happened 13,000 years ago. But after that, can we say that that was the world flood? I don't know. But the fact is, is that something happened in a massive sense. A cataclysm happened. And if it can happen, quote unquote, naturally, the possibility is real. 
But the interesting thing about all of this, and boy did I go down a lot of rabbit holes last week, and I do mean a lot of rabbit holes, a lot of bunny trails. And you can go to scripture, all kinds of scripture that talk about a lot of different things. I mean, just like I said, you know, the, the uh, uh, Nephilim are in scripture elsewhere, the giants. Now, after the flood, the giants are still around. They're still with us. Have you ever heard the name Goliath? And even in the conserv- most conservative translation of, of the description of Goliath, he was at least close to seven feet tall. And if you are looking around at the average height of individuals in the time of King David, somewhere between five to five foot two. So if you're five foot two and pretty much everybody else is five foot two and then there's a guy walks in that could play in the NBA. Interesting. And when the Jewish people first arrive back to the promised land and they're supposed they're commanded by God to go and conquer the land and take the land back. They send out scouts and the scouts come back in the in Numbers uh, chapter thirteen verses thirty one to thirty three. They talk about, you know, oh yeah, it's you know, but we don't want to go there because everybody's giant. There's a bunch of big people there. And they even say in verse 33, we saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Now, a lot's going on. You know, we can sit here and go, oh, well, it wasn't true. But what's harder to believe, that there were giants on the earth, or that some guy died and rose from the dead three days later? Or what's more impossible to believe that there were giants in the world, that angels came down from the celestial realm and decided to try and rule the earth instead of God, or that a woman named Mary 2,000 years ago was visited by by an archangel and said that you have found favor with God. And that a child was born that we call the Immaculate Conception, the virgin birth, which is, which is harder to believe. Because the scriptures are full of things that are hard to believe. And then when you look at this scripture and we look at this text and we see that all is not bad, all is not wrong, all is not lost because God in Genesis 6 verses uh, 8 but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There's all this horribleness, all this stuff going on, you know, uh, angels coming down and, and, and finding ways to be worshipped as if they are God themselves. But Noah found favor with God. You see, the point that I want to make here, despite all this other crazy stuff, all this talk of giants and, and many Elohim, sons of God, and all the craziness and, and all the wonderfulness of, of ancient archaeology, if you really go into the to study this stuff that's been going on for the last you know couple hundred years, things that have been discovered, things have actually proven things in Scripture... Despite all of that, I want you to see that even in this, even in the great wickedness of the world, even in the second rebellion, the first rebellion and the second rebellion and the third rebellion is going to be the Tower of Babel and Nimrod trying to reach the heavens to control God. But despite all of this, despite all of this, whose plan is actually in action and doing 
what needs to be done. The Father's plan, the plan of salvation. And we can look at all this and we can argue over this happened and that happened. But in the end, the one thing that I want you to take away from all of this as you study Scripture is what is the conclusion? No matter how you interpret or want to interpret, especially this section of Genesis, because it's kind of difficult. Angels and women and giants and craziness. No matter how you want to interpret that or look at that, the section of Genesis, there is the same response from God that there is in Genesis 3 and that will be in Genesis 11 and that still is the same response today is I'm not giving up. Now God brought the flood and yeah, a lot of destruction there. But he doesn't give up. He finds Noah, and Noah has favor. Noah becomes a new Adam, if you will. But ultimately, all of this, all of this is pointing towards the true second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, singular, and the Son of Man, singular. The answer to inequity, wickedness, is not anything less than Jesus Christ. The Son of God, salvation begins long before the problem, folks. Because in, again, in, in the Gospel of John, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and through, all thing, through the Word all things were made and are held together through the Word of God, and who is the Word of God according to the Gospel of John is the Son of God who is Jesus Christ. Before sin and death, the solution was already established. Dwell on that. No matter how we wrestle with the Old Testament or the New Testament and anything else in this world, anything else in this life, that the solution, your salvation, was established before anything ever went wrong. <clears throat> and with that, I say to the glory of the Father, in the name of the Son, and by the overwhelming power of the Holy Spirit, Amen and all men. Would you please join us in our closing hymn, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is. King of love, my shepherd is, who goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine. Streams of living water flow, my ransom soul believeth, and wherever the pastures grow with food celestial feed. In this dark vale I feel no ill With Thee, dear Lord, beside me Thy rod and staff, my comfort still Thy cross
us before to guide me. And so through all the length of days, thy goodness faileth never. Good shepherd, may I see thy praise within thy house So I receive this benediction. Go forth into this world renewed and restored children of God. Shine the light of Christ, the true salvation, the way, the truth, and the life to a dark and broken and hurting world. We are the resurrection people because we know the one who is the resurrection. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, stands and the kingdom of darkness has no power over it. May we go forth shining beacons of truth and life to the glory of the Father in the name of the Son, and by the power of the Lord, all men and all men. God be with you till we meet again. By this counsel's God uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet.